it's 401 and we're going to start the next installment of the AO Trauma Hand North America course and we're going to discuss the distal radial ulnar joint. So to that end, let's see if we can get this to move along. What happened to my slides? There it is. Okay. So I'm Doug Hannell. I'm the moderator. We're going to have Tom Fisher from Indianapolis and David Dennison from the Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota, Steve Kennedy from Seattle. And uh, I, I like the fact that he is the chief of hand and upper extremity at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. I don't know where that came from, but he really isn't. He's my partner. And uh, Marco Risen. So None of us have a disclosure that's going to impact these lectures. The participants um, can type in their questions. I will be paying attention to those questions, um, as well as the rest of the faculty um, who are either participating or asking or listening to these lectures. Um, your microphones are going to be muted. Your videos will be turned off as participants. So our learning objective are listed as to define the functional anatomy of the distal radial ulnar joint, which is no need to ask, determine when an ulnar head fixation is necessary, and define the indications for the most common reconstructive procedures when dealing with the distal radial ulnar joint. So the distal radial ulnar joint was introduced to us as the black hole of the wrist by Terry Axelrod in the first lecture of this series. And if we look at uh, the definition of a, of a black hole going to Neil deGrasse Tyson, we, we find that it's a mysterious entity in space where nothing, not even light, can escape. And astronomers have long observed, but not completely understood, the effects of the surroundings of these phenomena. So this is sort of like the distal radio ulnar joint, which is inherently unstable. There's skeletal mischief that leads to incongruence of articular interfaces, misshaped sigmoid notches, and variable lengths. There's an soft tissues that are in contribute to the inherent instability. And we're really arguable about what those soft tissues mean. And then as we look at this, there is a dynamic stabilizers in the extensor carpi ulnaris and the pronator quadratus. To try to make sense of this, I've asked Tom Fisher to discuss the functional anatomy that he thinks is important to this joint. David Dennison, I've asked him, what do you do when you have a perfect radius, but you have an unstable distal radial ulnar joint? Marco Rizzo will talk about the impact and treatment of ulnar impaction, how you treat it in the setting of distal radius fractures. Steve Kennedy will discuss the role for the section arthroplasty, and in the end, I'll discuss what you do when everything else fails. And to that end, I'd like to introduce uh, Tom Fisher, who is going to discuss the important anatomy of the distal radial ulnar joint. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Tom will share his. Tom, I think you're muted. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm uh, going to try to make sense of this postage stamp size piece of anatomy and uh, see if we can uh, get to um, a consensus about what's uh, good and what's bad with um, the uh, soft tissues and the bony anatomy of uh, the human DRUJ. Uh, let me get this bigger. And um, excuse my slowness, I can't get to my, there we go. Make that big. want to um, go to the projector. I, I'll get it. Yeah, Great. thanks. Yep. All right. So um, my job is to uh, talk about uh, this uh, piece of real estate. And really the arthrology of the distal radial ulnar joint, it's not a postage stamp. It's really kind of a global problem of the forearm joint. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And then it's the ulnocarpal joint also. And we'll uh, go into that a little bit. Uh, the, you know, the forearm is really a ring joint like any other uh, ring in the body, the pelvic ring, the tib-fib axis, 
et cetera. And uh, the um, the DR or the forum is like a pretzel. You can't just break it in one place. So when you have a disorder of the of the DRUJ, it's usually just due to something else in many cases when it comes to instability. So we've got the ulnocarpal component and the forearm joint component. Uh, the conceptual categories of the forearm axis is uh, we're looking at Essex Lepresti fractures, the Italians, Galeoxy and uh, Montesia, and uh, they all affect this little joint. But we're going to focus uh, just on the, uh, the smaller piece of the equation, uh, just in this distal quarter of the um, forearm with distal radius, distal radial ulnar joint, and distal ulna. Uh, this is Haggart's uh, concept of the bicondylar joint, and it's really a weight-bearing joint with the uh, ulna being the longitudinal axis of the forearm that lifts the forearm via the brachialis uh, in the uh, locked into the humerus. So uh, if you get a lateral of the ulna, it's always a lateral of the humerus. humerus. If you get an AP of the ulna, it's always an AP of the humerus. So they're inextricably linked. And how we stabilize the distal end is what we're going to talk about uh, this evening. So the osteology of the distal radial joint is pretty interesting. You always orient yourself with that uh, Lister's tubercle up there uh, and then the notch for the ECU sitting right next to the styloid. You always know that's going to be dorsal. And uh, the styloid is always in line with the uh, tip of the olecranon. So that's a posterior border that you're looking at downstream. And what's interesting in the, in the cuts, here's from uh, Randy Bender's uh, uh, work on on the rotation of the forearm, but it really represents the weight-bearing line through the distal radius. But as you go more distal, you see this big teardrop of the lunate fossa, where the lunate fossa is also inextricably linked to the seat of the ulna, i.e. the distal radial ulnar joint. And you have this big uh, protuberance down there that's uh, a pretty good buttress, uh, only if it's combined with a large piece of soft tissue ligament uh, associated with that teardrop on the distal radial ulnar joint ligaments. The joint reactive force, this is where the ulna lifts the radius. And uh, on axis, it's a pretty good job of uh, lifting it. And uh, you saw the on axis view here. But when you uh, get a little off axis, um, uh, things start to fall apart unless you have good soft tissues. And so the, the remote stabilizers are really the IOL for longitudinal and for uh, uh, rotation and then the proximal radial ulnar joint. You put it all together and you have this joint reactive force, the weight in the hand uh, holding down the, uh, or put, putting weight on the distal radial ulnar joint. And you get this force diagram that Bill Kleiman drew up uh, a few years ago and uh, has let me use it. But uh, you really have a pretty short lever arm through the hand and wrist, a really long lever arm through the forearm. So uh, the influence of the proximal radial ulnar joint uh, is pivotal on the distal radial ulnar joint. And here's that off axis, a, AKA pronation and supination. And uh, to get weight bearing in that vertical column off axis, you need these ligaments, or at least in part these ligaments. And uh, the fovea, which has got various um, names to it. I always just call it the fovea, the foveal insertion or the fovea ulnaris. And that's the real pivot point. And it's also the major spot weld of the uh, distal radial ulnar joint that uh, when it comes apart, things become unstable. And so uh, we're really talking about things distal to the IOL insertion. And uh, we're talking about the pronator. And we're talking about the uh, distal oblique ligament. And, and here uh, Bob Hotchkiss uh, popularized this type of look of the, of the membranous portion and the dense IOL portion. Uh, but uh, it wasn't until later that we started talking about the distal oblique ligament and the, and the main elements of stability of the distal radial ulnar joint. So uh, I, I refer you to Moritomo, uh, who's written uh, extensively uh, on uh, this subject of uh, all the stabilizers just south of the TFCC. And it's really uh, three things. It's uh, distally, it's the, it's the um, uh, fovea and the distal oblique ligament. So here's the foveal insertions in blue and the superficial capsular insertions in green. They're, they're really a composite, but uh, the, the blue ones are the, are the main, uh, uh, main uh, weight bearers of this uh, joint. And so 
Uh, it's uh, you can call it the ligamentum subcreatum, but I like to call it just the fovea. So here we are on axis again, and your surface contact's about 60%. It's a slide and glide joint. It's not much different than the glenohumeral joint when it comes to uh, its uh, dynamics and in, in uh, uh, rotation and, and translation. And uh, here we've got the the styloid and and the fovea really holding. Uh, the, the ulna from coming off the radius or the radius coming off the ulna, depending on how you want to view it. Uh, but uh, this uh, complex of capsule, ligament, and then as Doug talked about, the ECU stabilizers uh, as they integrate into that uh, dorsal rim. I always look upon the ECU as, as kind of a sheet on a sail, and it keeps the, the, the TFCC from kind of luffing in the breeze as you... Uh, rotate the forearm and uh, keeps the, uh, 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 the TFCC in a dynamic stabilization. When you look at the anatomy, it's really hard to tell where the seams are. And uh, it's really the ulnocarpal joint is really uh, integrated nicely into the radiocarpal joint, and especially the lunate fossa. And always remember, whatever happens in the lunate fossa happens at the seat of the ulna on the distal radio ulna joint. So the ulnar collateral ligaments uh, to the to the um, uh, carpus uh, with the um, uh, volar and dorsal uh, uh, ligaments, mostly volar for uh, the integration of the carpus to the end of the ulna, and mostly uh, to the fovea uh, via uh, insertions onto the uh, deep portion of the TFCC. So you put those uh, those elements together and uh, you can bear load off axis when pronation and supination when the ulna isn't or the radius isn't stacked onto the distal ulna so the angular moment or the angular malunion of this joint um, uh, as i stated is if you bend the lunate fossa you also rotate the seat of the ulna and the radius hence also uh, causing a disparity in the contact surface and hence in the weight bearing surface both in pronation supination and in straight up uh, neutral axis uh, of rotation and um, this paper is quite good in in quantifying the uh, effect of uh, uh, dorsiflexion uh, on the seat of the ulna on the radius and so you're relying uh, less on your bony constraints when this happens and more on your twisted soft tissue constraints. And so um, most of our anatomy uh, really looks at the groove on the ulnar, distal ulnar head for the ECU, but the ECU continues distally and integrates its vertical step septum between five and six and the vertical septum between the, on the six U side towards the ulna. Uh, it integrates that into the dorsal TFCC. The fifth dorsal compartment also integrates itself into the dorsal TFCC. So those are the dynamic stabilizers. And with the ECU being such a powerful ulnar deviator and dorsiflexor of the wrist, uh, it also pulls uh, uh, soundly uh, on the DRUJ, uh, i.e. the TFCC. So the ECU integration is an important piece of the concept, but whenever we see cross sections, we also just see the ECU sitting in the notch of the ulna, but remember, it goes more distally. And if you look at this, um, uh, if you look at this um, area right here where this uh, probe is, that's really the ECU integration into that dorsal rim of the TFCC. That's that area. And so those two vertical septi are, are quite uh, potent. They're quite firm and they anchor themselves uh, nicely into both the fovea and the dorsal rim. And so when we uh, have these um, TFCC tears just in the subsheath of the ECU, it's basically a, uh, a modest or a minor instability, but it's a pain generator. I, I liken it almost to a tennis elbow of the wrist when the TFCC uh, pull or the ECU pulls up on the dorsal rim of the T TFCC. That's a pain generator, but not necessarily a gross instability generator. And then the linear malunions, there's not much new about that. Milch, even back in 1953, 
really uh, gave us uh, all we need to know. Uh, we've uh, we've massaged it a little bit, but but uh, uh, here's a guy who uh, really understood uh, the mechanics of the TFCC. Uh, excuse me, of the disc rated ulnar joint long before uh, many of us did. And so um, ulnar carpal abutment. Uh, we're going to go through those kind of cases, but remember. For every one millimeter of ulnar positive variance, you shift the weight-bearing load to the ulna by somewhere in the neighborhood of 18% up to three millimeters. So you can really shift the, the load over uh, to the ulna uh, by some 54% when the radial column is 84% and the ulnar column is 16% as our standard kind of load vertical load-bearing columns. And the ulnar carpal abutment uh, is uh, both uh, affecting the carpus as well as the uh, cartilage disc itself. So in summary, the forearm is a bicondylar joint um, that uh, uh, bears weight and uh, uh, articular malunions are affected mostly by the shape and size of the distal radius malunion. And um, the load that uh, we need to bear uh, is always uh, compromised by any sort of soft tissue disruption off the radius off the radial fragments or off the fovea of the ulna. And the outside, uh, 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 the outside influences being the ECU uh, tendon is a major influencer. So uh, remember the weight bearing surfaces is usually about 80-20 uh, um, uh, uh, radius to ulna and we can shift that around by malunion and, and uh, vertical uh, linear malunion. What we're trying to avoid is this, is the dreaded one bone forearm. Uh, it's stable, but it's also quite predictable and losing a whole lot of, of function. And so uh, when you need to hold things up, you need supination. And so uh, I hand this off to my fellow um, uh, uh, conferees to uh, explain all those pathologies. Thank you very much. Hey, so Tom. I have yes, one sir. question from the audience, and it's how can a ligament be tight when the insertion and the origin get closer, and how can it be laxed when the origin and the insertion get farther apart? Well, I, I think it has to do with the linear, the, the pull of the ulna on the, on the, um, on the radius. And um, I think the fovea is actually isometric uh, as far as the rotation, but the cam effect of the odd shape of the ulnar head and that big uh, palmer uh, cam effect of the, of the um, uh, teardrop of the distal radius, i.e. the lunate fossa, has uh, some effect on it, but it's the deep and the superficial capsular ligaments. The deep ones have a much higher angle of attack and the superficial ones have a much uh, 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 more obtuse angle of attack. So I think the, uh, the combination of deep ligaments and superficial ligaments uh, twist on each other, but it's, uh, it's really the, the arthrology of the joint that uh, I think gives you the most amount of tensioning at that fovea, uh, both dorsally and palmarly, depending on supination and pronation. You're really not changing uh, the the deep capsule or the deep ligaments that much. It's the superficial ligaments that behave more like what you would expect, and the deep ligaments actually uh, behave oppositely. Okay, well, thank you, and thank you for a great lecture. I'm going to turn the turn over to David Dennison, who's going to discuss the question. You got a perfect radius. You got an unstable distal radial ulnar joint after fracture management. What do we do about that? Okay, hopefully that's looking okay to everybody. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us um, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, just wanna to say too, thanks to everybody here. Dick Berger uh, taught me maybe everything I know, but if the radius is perfect and the DRJ or the ulna isn't, we wanna consider a couple things. One is all the ligamentous stuff that we just kind of heard about and the TFCC. What does the styloid fracture matter? And also what about the distal ulna fracture? It might just be that the distal ulna itself is unstable, but Let's look at that quickly. And I think one of the things Alex Shin taught me is you gotta understand the injury. If you don't understand it, it's gonna be really hard to put it back together. So whether that means uh, looking at it, the exam, imaging, whatever it is, but I like to keep this in mind, identify the injuries to the DRJ, 
and imagine the ones that are there that you can't see, and then treat that instability along with the fractures. Part of that means making sure you understand and have a sufficient imaging uh, to see things like this and the diastasis. These are kind of obvious ones. And the uh, this dislocation, a radiocarpal dislocation plus a DRUJ dislocation. Um, CTs are helpful for me for some things. This is an example of a case on that CT where that sigmoid notch just wasn't captured with the, with the volar plate. And every time we slid it, it just slid out and we had to pin the sigmoid notch fragment down. So that helped to know that that was the case beforehand. Um, I think just uh, two seconds on this, but we've heard about the, uh, the dinaros, distal interosseous oblique ligament. Not everybody has it. You don't know who has it when you're treating them. So it kind of doesn't matter, but you got to think about it and retention things. And Scott Wolf has a nice example of this for the radius. Uh, Mark Ross as well. Lots of people have shown us that by fixing the radius, we, we help restore any of that soft tissue tension by spreading the radius in the ulna part. So um, I do that by a lift maneuver that I was taught, and we lift the radius up, make sure that we reduce the volar ulnar corner. That's where Dick taught us to, to do the reduction and then kind of fix everything around that. Rob Medoff showed us how to slide the styloid um, or lift the shaft up with the screw using a radial styloid plate. But in any case, you want to make sure you retention that and get that also allows the TFCC and the styloid fracture to land where they're supposed to, hopefully. So what about ulnar styloid fractures? Well, 20 years ago, if you had a big basal or fracture, it was kind of thought you had to fix it. And the tip fractures may not really need much help. But um, I'll give you a, we'll just fast forward almost two decades. Once we started seeing volar plating outcome, we saw that all of a sudden it didn't seem to matter so much. Lots of studies, I stopped counting once I ran out of room here, but that the displaced ulnar fr styloid fracture didn't matter as much as if the DRJ was unstable after you had an anatomic reduction of the radius. So that seems to be protective with volar plating in particular. So the general thing is now that we treat only the instability of the DRJ after ORF. You're not compelled to just fix it because the styloid fracture is there. And this is a great study that showed or taught me that um, the, if you look at this, the instability is actually higher in the isolated distal radius fractures than the ones that had concurrent styloid fractures. So that reminds me to look out, examine that DRJ once you fix the, fix the radius so you don't miss it. So what about the DRJ? If it's reducible and stable, we're down the left side, we're not really having our discussion. If it's on the right side and it's not reducible and it feels spongy and it doesn't feel right, you have to look at what the things could be that are in there. ECU, TFC, extensor. I've only seen these with obvious Galeazzi injuries myself. Um, or if the, DF, if the distal radius fracture is not reduced or the sigmoid notch in particular might not be reduced. And then if it's reducible and unstable, you can choose whether you want to pin it, radius to ulna, do a suture repair, styloid repair, or an X-fix and an outrigger. So in general, the, um, the instability that treatment that we like is in gen most of us here prefer to try to do some kind of a repair that doesn't require the pins. And if we can get that reduced and stable enough in neutral rotation, um, that's kind of our preference, I think, for most of us here. Certainly you can do the other things, you can pin it in supination and the other things, but um, there's no real overwhelming evidence that one is superior. So you have to know which one you can manage. Post-op, again, we prefer the neutral rotation so we don't have a supination or a pronation contracture, but you have to decide what you can deal with. This is uh, just an example historically what some of these look like. This is, I just don't really like to get into that if I don't have to. This is why I don't like for uh, using K-wires across the radial ulnar joint. This works, you wanna go across four cortices because they break and then they look like this. This is why I don't like it because this invariably seems to happen to me even with a good splint. So I try to get it stabilized uh, without having to do that, but you can certainly use these methods if you need to. Make sure you go through all cortices so you can get them out when they break if it happens. If you're gonna fix the ulnar, if the fovea, um, I prefer the dorsal exposure through the fifth compartment. We can get down and see the fovea and make a separate incision down to the TFC or whatever you need to do. There's good visualization there. Um, this is just an example, hand fingers to the left, elbow to the right on a left arm. You can see the EDQ very simply there, release it, retract it, go through the floor, T-shape it over here, protect the ECU, and you have a nice exposure down into the fovea. Or if you need to fix the ulnar head, which will be at the end of my talk, so the same exposure. Um, and I prefer suture drill holes, but you can do it however you like to do that. 
Uh, this is an example, just a case. I was like, wow, this is pretty interesting. It's a Galeazzi with the distal radius. There's actually another radius fracture aside from the obvious one there. So we treated this and you can see how displaced the DRJ is. Could not reduce that without um, making an incision to do that. You can't see it here on the back, but we got it reduced, did a long plate. Radius looked great. Interestingly, this was pretty stable. We were gonna fix the TFC when we went back to skin graft him. It was stable, didn't fix it. He came back. Interestingly, we didn't have to do a suture repair. A little bit surprising, but it worked out with splinting. Conversely, here's a Galeazzi, nice one with, it's giving you the exposure to put your anchor in. So we did the dorsal exposure, made sure nothing was in there, placed the anchor, fixed the radius, and then you can do your suture repair of the TFC and the ulna on that side. So some of those kind of give you that, some you have to work for a little bit more. This is just her outcome and she went out and bought another motorcycle, unfortunately. Um, if you're gonna fix the, the styloid, there's lots of ways to do it. Um, Dick kind of taught me that if you use a wire, you have to watch that wire break and then explain why it's broken. So we use a K wire if we need to, or I do, and then use a suture, um, literally like a large Vicrol or Ethabon or something and just tension it down if you need to. It's my preferred way to do it, but you can do lots of ways. If you wanna go on the ulnar side specifically, I like to do that for the styloid and or a foveal repair. Uh, if I'm gonna fix both, in other words, make sure you protect the sensory branch of the ulnar nerve. It's the one thing that you wanna make sure you don't have to, and you may still get some numbness, but if you find it and protect it, usually it'll recover. So be careful. Uh, you can reach in there and get a nice repair and fix the styloid if you want to. This is just an example from Rob Medoff. A couple of different ways. I won't get into lots of ways to fix this. You have to choose how you want to do it. I think the pin in a suture works very well, assuming the radius is fixed well. Okay, so what about ulnar head and neck fractures? These, we see these commonly. It tends to be, I think, probably more often in some of the osteoporotic older women. But if it's stable and it's not really displaced, you don't have to do a whole lot to it. You fix the radius if the alignment looks good and you wiggle it around and it's not too bad. A splint works about three to four weeks. You can get them out of that and it goes on to heal. It's not perfect in some of these, but they've all healed. I didn't have to do much. And you can see this lady wanted her fix it off. This is an old fracture in time to go to the casino in Vegas. Um, she did well. She won some and she had pretty good rotation as well. So it doesn't have to be a volar plate, but you have to have stable fixation and good reduction of the radius and then the ulnar head may be fine without a whole lot to it. Um, here's another one, 68 year old female, pretty bad radius and ulna. You're not quite sure how that ulna is gonna look till we're done. Radius looked pretty good with our distal radius fracture fixed with a nice fuller plate and left it alone. It, I would argue it's a little long. She has good rotation, good alignment, no infection, no malunion. Getting onto the ulnar head and neck fractures that are unstable or displaced. So if you have one that you're looking at and it's a big split in the head and it's a younger person, you're probably obliged to try to reduce that just like you would any other articular fracture. Um, obviously more than a significant step off, shortening, rotation, all those things. But beware of the really comminuted one because you may open it and realize you can't do much better. Um, if you're gonna fix it, I think the dorsal exposure works well as you can see. If it's just gonna be a neck fracture or the styloid, I would prefer to do it ulnarly. Uh, it's pretty easy to work up and down on that side. If it's, um, David Ring wrote a great article about this when I was younger and I said, wow, that was great. He had to work with the chondral blade plate. Fortunately, when I was out of fellowship, we had some nice locking options. So part of it is fixing the fracture, of course, and the articular portions. But also the other thing, thinking about the dorsal interosseous oblique ligament or the DOB, however you want to think about it, it's important to make sure the ulnar shaft doesn't collapse into the radius as well. So fortunately, some of these devices will help or your, radi your radius reduction will help you prevent that too. But if it's unstable or if, it's, if you're having that convergence from the ulnar shaft, um, I wrote up a series of this when I was trying to figure out what to do with these. And fortunately, it worked out pretty well. I would say that if you're going to use a distal plate, ulnar side is pretty safe. Make sure those pegs don't go into the ECU groove from the side. And if you go on the palmer side, think about your, um, like a radial neck, if you're gonna fix it, there's a safe zone. You don't wanna go too far. So if you check it in pronation, you'll know that you're not, the plate's not too far in the way in the front, but you can go in the front if you have to, as this picture on the left shows. Fortunately, most of these healed. We didn't have many sensory branch issues and very few plates had to come out and it's a small plate. Um, just another example here, trick just to use a K-wire at the end so you know where the end is and you can put the plate right into the head and that can help you with those distal head and neck injuries and um, 
it's it's pretty simple to do and it's it's the same technology and might be in the same set that you have for your distal radius. So one of the real take home points for my section is just that if you have this picture on the left, it's just like the picture of having the, the short distal or the DOB, it's not taut. So if you can reduce that and get the all know back where it belongs, you improve that stability hopefully. So this is an example of a case here where I fixed the radius and the ulnar head really wasn't in a good position. You can see that the, the space between the radius and the ulnar on the right is not very wide. And on the left, it's just displaced, of course. But when we fix it, you can see that by using the plate to help bring the ulnar shaft back out towards the ulnar side of the head and the neck, that we've restored that interosseous space. And I think that really is something that can help with these and help you preserve that ulnar head. I'll do everything I can to keep the ulnar head and the stability of the DRJ without having to think about some of the things that are gonna come later in our in our discussion. So a couple of things to think about. I, I would just suggest that you make sure you understand the injury. Um, imaging helps me quite a bit, especially if I don't like how the sigmoid notch looks. Know a few ways to stabilize the DRUJ and to fix the phobia and the styloid. And I would say uh, just our preference here has been to try to, to work towards neutral rotation splints so we don't have a significant pronation or supination contracture to work at, uh, from later. And thanks very much. So David, let me reinforce that last statement. It's, so you put together this terrible fracture, which is, which seems to be the biggest indication is a, a very common in an unstable distal radius and then a common in an unstable distal radial ulnar joint and an, uh, and an ulnar head. You put it together with your with a rigid device. You had now have a stable distal radial ulnar joint on the table, and you keep them in neutral for six weeks. Well, I will start with um, a neutral splint, and then if they are, um, I'm just going to go back to this for one second. If they are, a, if I have good fixation. And I think I've converted them back to that sort of person that had a minimally displaced ulnar neck fracture. Then around three to four weeks, we'll go to a neutral rotation Munster where they begin to rotate on their own at three to four weeks. But they will still be in a Munster removable splint in neutral. So thank you for clarifying. It's not a full six weeks. If they have a really unstable DRUJ with a foveal repair, I would probably lean a little more towards uh, considering up to six weeks in a neutral splint if it's, if it's all soft tissue. Great. Well, thank you very much. That's an excellent lecture and a lot of work. I appreciate it. You do. I'm going to introduce Marco Rizzo and turn over the screen to him, and he's going to discuss the treatment of ulnar impaction syndrome in the setting of distal radius trauma. Thanks, Doug, and thanks for having me. And uh, this first two lectures were great. Thanks, Dave, and thanks, Tom. Um, let me know if you can't see my screen. Um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully you can see. Okay. Um, so my charge is to talk about ulnar shortening versus radial lengthening or both. And um, I thought it would be nice to sort of present this as a case-based discussion. And I'll start with the first case, 72-year-old female who fell. She had these initial x-rays and ultimately underwent a, an attempt of failed closed reduction that led to this appearance of x-ray with uh, significant uh, ulnar-sided wrist pain and deformity, um, pain with ulnar deviation, limited pronosupination and pain. The radiocarpal joint was non-tender. The DRUJ felt stable. And um, her radiographs demonstrate the collapse and carpal malalignment and dorsal tilt. But important to note also no obvious uh, radiocarpal arthrosis. Um, she, um, so what we're dealing with here is ulnar carpal impaction. And, and uh, Tom uh, illustrated this quite nicely in his talk on the anatomy. We understand that we're going to increase loading on the ulnar side of the wrist, which leads to the chondromalacia, LT disruption, DREJ arthrosis. And malunited distal radius fractures are one of the most common etiologies for this problem. And that's, uh, that's where I was going to focus most of our talk on was maybe um, on the discussion with uh, malunited distal radius fractures. So let's go back to our patient. We look at her a little bit closer, nine millimeters of ulnar um, positive variance, 30 degrees of dorsal tilt, at least 50 degrees of carpal malalignment with the radial lunate angle. I mean the uh, capital lunate angle. And the radiocarpal joint again looks pretty good. 
And in terms of plan, we'll come back to this case in a little bit. Um, so it leads to a variety of questions when you're seeing these patients and how to proceed. And at least as I was thinking about this, you know, patient factors, age, comorbidities, whether they're a smoker and things of that nature, the radiographic factors are uh, very, very important. How much dorsal tilt, how much ulnar variance, is the carpus malaligned? Is there arthritis? And clinical factors such as motion, where's the pain? and uh, what provokes the pain and what's the stability of the DRUJ. These are all critical things. And it led me to coming up with this algorithm, which looks a little scary at first, but it sort of asks some important questions like what is the radial malalignment? What is the carpal malalignment? Is there arthritis of the DRUJ? How much is the owner variance? Um, are they older? Are they less active? And what is the stability of the DRUJ? So basically hovering around four or five questions that with the help of folks like Diego Fernandez, we can get some guidelines that 10 to 12 millimeters was uh, from Diego's work. And it, it's not a hard and fast rule. For example, if there's less than 10 millimeters of owner variance, you still may need to do an owner procedure. So be prepared for that but leaning more towards the need for an, an additional owner procedure in patients with more variants uh, is intuitive and makes sense. And uh, plus or minus 20 degrees of tilt in either direction and greater than two of radial inclination is deemed what uh, is acceptable according to both Diego and Dave Roosh and the group at Duke uh, uh, led us uh, to, to learn. So with that in hand, let's go through some cases. Now, before we do that, there are some caveats. Older or less active individuals, you can loosen some of those parameters of what's acceptable. You don't necessarily have to do an owner shortening in someone who doesn't have arthritis in an elder, older person. You can, you can uh, consider uh, ADERA, for example, if they're low, if they're, uh, you know, relatively low uh, activity level and, um, and have a significant number of comorbidities. And important to respect those comorbidities, be prepared to have a plan B intraoperatively, um, assess the DRUJ after every procedure you do to make sure that it's not neglected. And remember, a corrective osteotomy of the radius should be considered a contraindication in someone who has the presence of radiocarpal arthrosis, so keep that in mind. So let's start with some cases. This is case number one, a 74-year-old female who's relatively low demand and, uh, and uh, fragile. She, uh, she had this radius heel in this manner. And uh, thankfully on the lateral view, she doesn't have much by way of uh, uh, dorsal tilt, but she does have a significant amount of positive ulnar variance. The DRUJ is stable. She has pain with ulnar deviation and also with pronosupination. And um, you know her ulnar variance measured about four to five millimeters. Uh, again, there was no obvious arthrosis. There's no significant mal carpal malalignment on the lateral view. The dorsal tilt's acceptable. The radial tilt is notable and significant, measured about four, mil four degrees on my, on my exam. So should we do a corrective osteotomy of the radius in this patient? Should, what should we do with the ulna? And to me, I thought uh, not necessary to correct the radius, but a DARA procedure would be appropriate. Now, uh, Diego Fernandez, taught us that these are acceptable options for these patients, but important to remember and temporizing patient expectations that the deformity that they have will not correct. You know, they will have improvement of pronosupination and ulnar deviation, but the hand remains offset. So it's important that the patient knows that uh, preoperatively. So we go through our algorithm, we can see that we worked along the right side, acceptable radial uh, malalignment. She had no arthritis, she's older and less active. So we opted for the DARA procedure in her. And these are her x-rays at three months post-op. Um, another case, this is a 66 year old female who's a little bit more active and, and uh, likes to do more in terms of activity level. She had uh, this, this fracture with again, thankfully good uh, alignment on the lateral view of the radius, uh, minimal dorsal tilt. She had four millimeters of positive ulnar variance with a radial inclination of 14 degrees. So in this patient, uh, how, do we, how should we proceed? Well, I didn't think we needed to correct the radius. I did feel like an ulnar shortening would be a better predictable option for her. Um, in terms of her keeping up with her activity level. And, and again, this is that article from the Duke folks with Dave Roosh, uh, helping to create 
what we deem as acceptable, but also telling us that the ulnar shortenings in these patients are good options and they tend to do pretty well. So an ulnar shortening alone would be reasonable. Important also to assess the DRUJ after you do the ulnar shortening because you may have to address it and stabilize it. And this is her after seven months uh, after the ulnar shortening. And you can see she's, she does pretty well in terms of functionality. Here's another case. This is a case of a farmer who had this fracture fixed. And this is what the outcome, I think, of longstanding positive ulnar variance and potentially a mal, a mal uh, reduced fracture. But this patient developed uh, uh, what appears to be DRUJ arthritis as well as um, ono, uh, from longstanding onocarpal impingement. He also has ulnar translation of the carpus. You know, he has about four millimeters of positive ulnar variance. Uh, he does have uh, some dorsal tilt of the radius, but his carpal, his carpus is not malaligned uh, in the way we would expect. It actually has a little bit of a, uh, a flexed radi uh, flex lunate appearance, uh, no tenderness at the, at the radial carpal joint, and that's important to note. Um, and uh, how should we proceed? He also had pain at the, at the hardware that uh, uh, I think uh, necessitated uh, at least a discussion about removal of hardware. In addition, the plates off the bone a bit, which is uh, concerning as well. Uh, I opted not to move forward with the corrective radius uh, osteotomy on him and dealt with his arthritis. He did also have some evidence of radial carpal arthritis, which I think precludes the, uh, a radial corrective osteotomy in this patient. Uh, and Dakey uh, taught us a lot about uh, the Save Kapanji, and much of the data is very encouraging. And our own experience at Duke, we recently, I mean, here at Mayo, we recently published, and it was actually quite encouraging as well. There are complications. It's important to remember that a small percentage of the patients will have ulnar radial impingement, and it's important to have that discussion with the patient. Uh, and dealing with that can be tricky, and Doug's going to talk a lot about that in a little bit. Um, and But overall, I think the SK is a reliable procedure. I agree with Dakey's conclusions uh, for, for folks with advanced arthritis. A uh, couple pearls. One of the biggest pearls, I think, is uh, you don't want to resect more than 35 millimeters from, uh, and this ulnar stump should not be more than 35 millimeters from the end of the ulna. And that in their series was a predictor of patients with less uh, radiocarbal instability, I mean, ulnar stump instability and convergence. So if we go through the algorithm on this patient, you can see it's relatively short and it comes right, ends up with a DARA or SK uh, in this patient. And I think for him being a farmer, I thought the SK would be a better option. Although if he told me to prove it, I wouldn't be able to. And you can see here he is uh, two years post-op and he's actually doing quite good. He's a happy camper. The other advantage of the SK in this patient was that he did have ulnar translation of the carpus, which was a concern. So. Here's another case, case number four, a 24 year old female who had a, uh, an injury as a child and ultimately uh, developed a malunion that was corrected with this uh, fixation. And uh, she went on to uh, have some improvement for a while, but then developed uh, uh, worsening symptoms. Uh, she still had some evidence of positive ulnar variance. Her carpal and radial alignment was pretty good, but she had pain at the DREJ, pain with ulnar deviation, and also instability of the DREJ, which was a concern. Now, in this case, it's a little bit uh, interesting in that you can consider an ulnar shortening, which may stabilize her, but it's important to know that it might not. Uh, I want to go back to her original injury films and show her what she looked like before her radio osteotomy was done. And uh, the contralateral films are on the right. Um, and she did have, again, relief for a while. But I, one thing I've learned is in patients who have childhood injuries, the predictability of stabilizing the DREJ with a corrective osteotomy becomes uh, less than those who had a malunion as an adult. I don't know if it's been an observation of some of the other faculty or other the attendees, but I've noticed that, and that's a concern. Um, so my plan with her was to plan an ulnar shortening and assess the DREJ uh, and uh, stabilize it if need be. And we went along this algorithm route, except this was two surgeries. One was uh, up to the radial lengthening and then in the ulnar procedure and then assess the stability of the DRUJ and then stabilize. And ultimately she did have a, an Adams Berger procedure up here after I shortened her. And I also removed her hardware as it was troubling her. So let's go back to our original case. This is her at 
three months post-op. She underwent a corrective osteotomy and uh, I hadn't met her yet, but this was her at the corrective. And they did a pretty good job of getting her length out. But here she is at six months post-op and you can see now she's failed. She's, uh, she's uh, uh, lost her reduction, that uh, plates failed. And this is not, uh, this was something that up until recently was not really thought to be a huge deal, but uh, this group really showed us, Harness and their colleagues showed us that these complication rates are not inconsequential. And most often it's related to how aggressive we try to distract these, these, uh, these fractures. So don't be afraid at times to just simply do both in one setting. Like this case, this 23 year old male that I treated who had, uh, I couldn't, uh, it was uh, rather than jacking him out too far, I was able to also do an ulnar shortening on him. And unfortunately, in this case, they opted to try to treat her in the cast. And in nine months post-op, she's now even worse. She's collapsed further and she now has uh, median nerve symptoms and, and inability to flex the index finger, which ultimately necessitated more procedures. She had to have a tendon reconstruction, a carpal tunnel release, hardware removal, and, and uh, uh, a radial uh, iliac crest bone grafting with a radial lengthening procedure. Uh, when I got to that point, I ultimately ended up doing a dare on her because of her age and, and uh, the simplicity of the procedure at this point. And she also seemed to have evidence of arthrosis at the DRUJ, which led me to, to prompt uh, to do the, the DARA. So in summary, take home points. Um, you know, these patients are, can be challenging and you can do radial lengthening, correction and ulnar shortening or both. How to proceed is based on those clinical radiographic and age related factors and comorbidities that we discussed. Uh, correction can be challenging and understand that complications are not inconsequential and require meticulous technique. And treatment should be individualized based on, you know, all these factors, as we mentioned. Good results can be obtained when you address the source of the pain, the deformity, Make sure that their, their arthritis is uh, addressed if it's there or don't correct for patients with radiocarpal arthrosis. And also finally, remember the DRUJ and its stability and the importance of that and keeping tabs on it. Thanks a lot. So I am so glad that you're taking care of my patients. <laughs> no, it's, uh, Stop sharing here, sorry. <laughs> But they're all from Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> so as a point, and one of the questions that, that it's, it's raised is, will you ever combine like a, a weave reconstruction, Adam Berger weave, with an owner shortened same case? I will. I will, personally. I, and that's that one case that we did on um, that fourth case. Uh, and it's an if then kind of situation, Doug. I, um, you know, after you correct them, you assess. It's not very often because usually the owner shortening does a good job of stabilizing the DRUJ. Um, but I, I've learned to be prepared to discuss that with patients. And it doesn't have to be the weave, you could do a dorsal capsule plication, uh, something where you you feel like you've tensioned them up, or you may decide just to mobilize them a little longer. You know, go that six weeks of mobilization to sort of let them scar down and, and heal up. You know, and, and just as I, I think I, it, my experience, and it's, it, it's, I, I've done weaves first, and then realized that it wasn't stable enough, and there was no way that I was going to get it any more stable. And then at the same in the same operation, and then did my short, oh. and it may be a way to salvage or not so, so much salvage or to make a, a B plus weave re soft tissue reconstruction and A plus by just adding that increase in tension. That's clever. Uh, yeah, I, I found that, that that to be true. So, you know, it, it, one thing that we failed to mention, and, and David, I'd like, yeah, well, I'd like everybody in the panel's opinion on this is, is there such thing as an ulnar styloid non-union? And how do you treat those? And it's a loaded question because I, I will refer everybody to the Richards and Ru or Richards Roosh articles out of Duke on this particular subject. But 
it wasn't covered in these two lectures, and I know that Steve won't cover it in, in his. So what's your approach to owner styloid, painful owner styloid non-unions? Um, Dave. I'll go. It, and just to, as we leave Marco's thing for just a second, Marco has a great paper on the importance of a diaphyseal shortening of the ulna and how that has a better chance of giving some stability. So I know that he's always doing an, an you know, diaphyseal shortening, but it's a great read and uh, so it was, it was great research. So um, ulnar styloid non-unions, yes, they occur radiographically. Um, again, Dick taught me to be wary of going after an ulnar styloid non-union as the source of pain for, you know, if that's the, really what somebody's complaining about. So I've always been very careful about that. I think there are other things that can be there. It can be a foveal injury. It can be impaction. If it's a large styloid, they may have extension, ulnar deviation, supination pain, or if they have that, you know, um, sort of uh, bruise in the trichretrum uh, or some edema on, the, on an MRI or something. So I think there are occasionally some things where the styloid non-union can be maybe a pain generator, but I think it's less, I think it happens less common that if you go in there and just take the piece of bone out that someone's gonna be cured, in my opinion. Um, malunions are a, dis a different issue, which we didn't get into, but that's a separate thing. Cause if the malunion could have problems with rotation. So that's my thought anyway, I'll see what you guys think. Marco? Certainly, uh, you know, I, I agree with Dave and, and Dick taught us that as well, you know, if it is an honor styloid non-union alone, it's there's a component of supertentoriality to the patient that that they just don't like the fact that it's there and they want it out. So I have to try to convince myself there's a component of some instability that maybe the, uh, a TFC reefing or tightening after removal of the styloid or something that would if it's a, an irritating ulnar styloid, like Dave was suggesting, if there's some component of impingement or something beyond just the styloid itself. But I, I bet everyone here on the panel has taken out an ulnar styloid before for someone who's got pain on the ulnar side of the wrist. Um, but I typically will try to uh, convince myself that there's more to it than just the ulnar styloid. What do you think, Tom? Are you, do you take them out? Do you do you think they need to be scoped or reconstructed? I, I think it's a diagnosis of exclusion. I agree with Dave and, and Marco that you really got to look and make sure there's nothing else. I think on uh, on x-ray, you'll see sclerosis, almost like a pseudarthrosis type sclerosis between the two components. Uh, there are people who have had ulnar styloids, uh, non-unions for years, fall down, go boom, and then it becomes symptomatic. I think they're really kind of an enthesopathy uh, of the insertion of the superficial uh, capsule on that surface, but also the ECU subsheath is integrated to the dorsal uh, rim of the of the styloid. So just mo motion there can also aggravate it. So I'll scope them if their TFCC is normal. Their MRI shows edema of the distal uh, ulna. There's no triquetral impaction. Uh, I've done a diagnostic, uh, just the xylocaine injection to see if their grip strength goes up when we, uh, when we block it. And if all that uh, falls into place and points the ulnar styloid, I'll take it out and uh, sew the superficial capsule back down to the end of the ulna. But I, I agree with the panelists, you can't dwell on it too much. You gotta, but, you, but people with persistent pain, you gotta go and really prove it. So Steve Kennedy, if you've got the, the same scenario, you're going through and looking at this and and you scope them and they have triquetral chondromalacia or you're looking at bone, does that change how you treat them? <clears throat> well, I'll often start off by doing just a simple uh, debridement. In terms of going, you know, focusing on the ulnar styloid component, it might, it, you know, I, I, if, if I'm seeing that uh, denuded triquetrum that I'm thinking about um, ulnar carpal impaction, um, similar to what Tom was talking about, um, I think I, I also, you know, before I get to the arthroscopy stage, I'm also doing a lot about what has already been mentioned about really closely examining, um, you know, tincture of time and then uh, diagnostic blocks of the ulnar styloid uh, non-union site. You, uh, and I'll try to do that under fluoro just to be as confident as possible about that I have the, the needle exactly where I, where I want it to be. Um, and then um, if I'm doing a scope, I'll start off by 
de doing a debridement and uh, see how the patient does, but I'm going to be thinking about doing an ulnar shortening later. That's perfect. Well, thank you very much. It's all, I think it's great advice and it's something that that all of us are seeing in our practices and it's, it's nice to, to hear the common sense. And I think it really is common sense and advice from, from people who, who have had a lot of experience with this problem. So I'm going to introduce yes. Steve Kennedy, who's going to talk about five things to consider before resecting the distal ulna. Steve. Thanks a lot. So um, mm -hmm. I was tasked with discussing for the next 10 minutes uh, resection or arthroplasty. And um, I think that uh, my, inf my uh, talk is going to overlap a bit with uh, Marco's. And I just spent a lot of time just trying to avoid uh, doing uh, resection or arthroplasty. Um, I'm gonna start off with the case. This is a 60 year old male transit operator with an ulnar sided wrist pain. He had a work related bus crash four months ago. And importantly, he had a right wrist and elbow injury 12 years prior where he underwent a radial head arthroplasty uh, for a comminuted radial head and neck fracture. Uh, elbow is doing great and he was asymptomatic before this injury, um, but he has ongoing ulnar sided uh, wrist pain um, despite extensive conservative measures. And so um, he's got, uh, DREJ tenderness, he's got pain of the ulnar fovea. Um, compression causes some um, pain as well. And he's got some limitation of his form uh, range of motion. So I'd be interested to survey the audience or the panelists, but you know, I'd submit that many might consider uh, some sort of resection of the distal ulna in a case like this. And so I've got some um, tips that I kind of want to uh, go through that I think can um, be helpful. And they've been helpful in guiding my practice and I hope to pass them on here. So. First and foremost, it's important to remember that the DRUJ arthritis is not the only thing that may be causing pain. Ulnar sided wrist pain has been called the low back pain of the wrist. There are many different ways of discussing this, but I think this article by Kakar and Garcia Elias is, uh, should be required reading for any hand surgery uh, fellow. Um, they use a Venn diagram concept um, with uh, four overlapping leaves. Uh, it essentially asks four questions. Is there a bony deformity? Is there cartilage damage? Is there a TFCC injury? And is there an unstable uh, ECU tendon? And the answers to those questions are gonna help you formulate a treatment plan that um, involves the, uh, you know, uh, the combination of those um, different uh, options like corrective osteotomy, DREJ arthroplasty, are you gonna do ligament reconstruction um, or possibly an ECU uh, stabilization? And, um, Morotomo, as has already been mentioned, has uh, taught us a lot about understanding the intraosseous ligaments. And I think <clears throat> at this stage, we all understand um, the importance of uh, the intraosseous membrane in terms of distal radius fracture and uh, restoring the um, anatomy of the radius, restoring that uh, tightening of the distal uh, bundle, or the equivalent, as has already been mentioned, only, you know, what, 30% of people have a defined, well-defined uh, DOB but everybody has uh, some intraosseous uh, membrane and secondary stabilizers of the, of the DRUJ. And those uh, ligaments are important to think about that ring concept that was brought up at the, at the, at the beginning that um, taking, ad, ad, adding additional, or sorry, shortening the ulna in this situation can add some stability, stability to the DRUJ. But you also need to think about if you're gonna be considering doing an ulnar shortening osteotomy, you're also gonna potentially increase the contact forces at the DUJ, and that's gonna be uh, an important thing to think about. So if we go back to this 60 year old male transit operator um, who uh, could potentially be high demand, we see you know, uh, narrowing it as uh, DUJ, we see ulnar carpal impaction. Um, this is a person that I don't want, that I, I, I still wanna avoid resection. And so this is a case where I did um, an ulnar shortening osteotomy, but I did it at the ulnar neck. Um, I used a, a hook plate, um, and by doing this, I'm not uh, increasing the tension of the DOB or the equivalent soft tissues in the intraosseous membrane. And uh, I restored um, <clears throat> the uh, variance and uh, he had an excellent result. So at six months, he's worked back at work full time. Supination is 85, pronation is 80, and he no longer has any uh, symptoms. Um, I think the, uh, so I think the, the, the take-homes that I was trying to get across to that is that the uh, the DRJ arthritis may not be the only thing going on um, to, to consider that and uh, to always be thinking about the, the forearm ring as a, as a concept. The second thing that I would say is that DRUJ is imitated, but it's never duplicated. So it has uh, gliding and translation and finely balanced soft tissues, 
But if you look at, you know, a Dara resection or a hemi resection with tendon interposition or Soviet Kapanji, uh, it's impossible for them to fully uh, restore uh, the properties of cartilage and all of the important soft tissues. So it's important to consider all the options before you go ahead with that. If we look at um, uh, a variety of different studies, there's quite uh, variable in terms of uh, the rates of complications, but we can see rates of complications of you know 30 percent for dara or you know 50 percent for soviet kapanji depending on the series and uh, in many cases it might have uh, an, an unfortunate situation like this patient where they went from having uh, one procedure to another uh, soviet kapanji really results in non-union goes on to a dara you know stump instability um, and then they um, get a, a semi-constrained arthroplasty that may have its own uh, potential for complications so this is a 75 year old man that came into me. He's uh, morbidly obese, over 350 pounds, BMI of uh, 49, and uh, uses a walker for his uh, morbid obesity and uh, gets pain when he's pushing himself up out of a chair. And he had uh, pain and uh, tenderness and a little bit of instability at his ulna, the, the ulna kind of dorsally translated when he was doing this movement. And uh, he really wanted some relief uh, from his pain. Um, but rather than venturing into resection arthroplasty or the other, you know, more complex stabilization techniques that I didn't think he would be able to, you know, recover from appropriately with his demands, I just did a partial wrist innervation and did a PIN and AIN neurectomy. Uh, just get a bit, if you really want to get the most out of uh, partial denervation for the DRUJ, just get the AIN in particular, you got to get proximal to the perinator quadratus. Um, and uh, he had a, a fantastic result and didn't need, didn't need anything further, probably because he's not uh, very high demand either, apart from uh, pushing himself up out of a chair. Um, I think this has been touched on already, but a, a third thing that I would mention is that less is more for bone resection. Uh, soft tissue attachments maintain stability. I thought this was an interesting uh, read. This is by Manami uh, et al. from 2005 in hand surgery. And uh, they report their experience. Uh, and prior to the study or prior to when the enrollment of patients in this study, they um, their preferred technique was the DARA procedure, uh, but they were seeing a lot of uh, instability or residual subluxation. And uh, so they did uh, a comparison of their DARAs, their Soviet Kapanji procedures. They, some of their Soviet Kapanjis had uh, stabilization of the stump with ECU at the time of the surgery, and some did not. And um, their overall conclusion was that the um, superior results were, the, were with the hemi-resection interposition arthroplasty, where they had um, minimal resection, or their Soviet Kapanji procedure, where they incorporated an ECU stabilization at the time of the uh, index procedure. That resulted in the best uh, grip strength and uh, return to work also. Um, uh, Dr. Jupiter and uh, Neil Chen also, uh, and Dr. Chen um, also presented their results in 2019. Um, 66 patients, 8.6 year uh, on average follow-up. Quick dash was about 31, uh, but a significant pain relief with a pain of one over 10. Uh, satisfaction was nine out of 10 and a relatively low uh, complication rate um, doing this uh, hemi-resection interposition uh, procedure. Um, they noted that uh, patients with RA and other inflammatory arthritis did better, um, potentially because they're low demand and then uh, PIN uh, denervation also seemed to help. Um, just to show that I do do some uh, DARA resections, this is a 30-year-old male delivery driver. He was in a high-speed motor vehicle uh, collision with multiple uh, traumatic injuries, and his ulnar head was uh, shattered, and much of it was lost at the scene of the um, injury. And um, so I had no other alternative but to resect his ulna. Um, and, uh, but I resect as little as possible, and I still, um, uh, you know, as best as possible, uh, anatomically reduce the radius. At three months, he had no pain. He um, had pronation of 70 degrees, supination of 70 degrees, and he had uh, relatively good uh, wrist flexion and extension of, of 40 degrees each. Um, so I think uh, part of the, and he did not have uh, instability of that ulnar stump. And I think the reason was probably partly because of the trauma, um, but I think um, uh, that the, you know, the scarring probably contributed, but also that maintenance of the distal big bundle uh, or equivalent tissues in the area. So um, this also brings me to the fact that patient factors influence outcome. And I think um, this has already been touched on also, um, but uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, patients do significantly better. Um, also uh, elderly patients and a lower demand are, are gonna do better. 
um, 86% of rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis patients are going to be pain-free following surgery in, in one series. 36% um, of patients in the trauma group reported uh, pain relief, so uh, much uh, poorer or less, less advantageous. So, uh, and in pain, pain relief in post-traumatic patients is more predictable when that DREJ arthrosis is the sole cause of the, of, of the wrist pain. Still, uh, convergence, uh, kinetic dysfunction, and instability remain an issue for many patients. Uh, this is um, a, you know, a demonstration of that weight-bearing uh, view that we can see that uh, convergence. And um, this uh, concept of kinetic dysfunction is interesting because it's that, it's that um, transition from a weight from supination through neutral and into pronation or vice versa um, can cause discomfort and, um, and that can be quite bothersome for uh, people also. So if we, you know, my, my uh, patient where I did do the uh, DARA, uh, young, young guy, he still at six months was unlimited with his weight um, in his arm, supination or pronation. But when he was rotating at the same time, uh, it was quite bothersome, particularly with pouring jugs or other uh, large containers. Um, but still, he's you know not bothersome enough for him to uh, want to go ahead with any kind of further uh, procedures like uh, interposition arthroplasty. Um, but um, that might be something to uh, consider in future. Um, if you do have um, issues with instability, multiple techniques have been described to stabilize and unstable on the stump. There's ECU tendon techniques, there's combined uh, ECU and FCU tendon techniques. And in a small percentage of uh, patients, you might, um, if all things have been otherwise considered, you might also consider wide excision of the uh, remaining um, ulna. That can be a one kind of uh, last ditch effort option. So in summary, evaluate for all causes of ulnar sided wrist pain. Consider all surgical options before proceeding with resection arthroplasty. Um, consider patient factors and goals of care. These uh, So low demand elderly patients may benefit most from simple procedures with less risk of uh, complications. And when, risk, when the resection is undertaken, resect as little bone as possible and maintain or reconstruct the stabilizing soft tissues where appropriate and where convergence, um, kinetic dysfunction and or instability persistently interfere, consider surgical stabilization, interposition or uh, inter implant arthroplasty. So Steve, a, a question is, in that case where you chose to do uh, partial wrist denervation, how did you do? How did you work that up preoperatively, and how do you predict that that's going to be a benefit for the patient? Well, um, you can do a, um, a lidocaine uh, challenge. So uh, I drop a small um, volume of uh, local anesthetic lidocaine, and um, I'll uh, you know clean the, cleanse the skin and you know just pop it in there, and then I'll go and see another patient and I'll come back and see how they're doing. And um, I did that, uh, when I started doing that procedure, I used to do that a lot. I would do it for everyone, but the predictability of that, the positive predictive value is probably about 70%. And so there's still some people who, even if they have a you know, negative response to the challenge, they um, uh, may still benefit from the procedure. So it's still a, um, a real, uh, you know, uh, an option even still. I will nowadays I'll mainly do that um, injection for people who are not so convinced. You know, there's some people who really don't like the idea of having a nerve cut in their forearm, no matter what you say in terms of the evidence. And so when you can do a lidocaine injection and then they feel much better afterwards, um, that can be uh, compelling enough for them to say, okay, maybe I'll go ahead with this and try it out. Um, yeah. Oh, great. You know, grip, grip strengths before and after diagnostic injections are sometimes quite telling. You get rid of the pain inhibition, all of a sudden they got 20 pounds more grip and uh, it's convincing to you, it's convincing to the patient sometimes. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Thank you, strong effort. Um, I'm gonna finish up tonight, I think. It all depends on whether or not my talk shows up here and it might, let's do it. Can you see that? Or is it on? Yes, we can see it. You can see it, great, all right. So what are we gonna do when things don't work out? And, and so, you know, 
how successful are resection arthroplasty procedures? And if you look at the literature, and here's just a typical example, these come out, um, and there's been at least one or two every year that have looked at this and say typically 94% of the patients were satisfied, as in the study that looked at uh, the history of Jesse Jupiter's uh, uh, clinical experience and, uh, with, a, with a resection of position arthroplasty shown here. Um, but the question that's always raised by that is what do you do about the other 6%? And in all of those articles, and this is true, in all of the articles on this, nobody talks about what they did with their failures. They just talked about the 94% of patients that did well. And, and I can tell you that the 6% are coming to my office and that's what my practice really consists of. Is, and, and the same thing is true of elbows. But, you know, so what comes of it? Well, out of those people that you saw on that previous slide, you know, the dashes are high. They, they have to modify their work activities. They've had multiple procedures. Their pain scores are always elevated. They have pain with pronation, supination, especially when holding anything greater than five pounds. And in this illustration that comes from Lewis Shecker and from Lee and an article by Lees and, and Shecker who demonstrated the impingement that occurs when the stable ulna is impacted by the unstable radius. And it's not the ulna that's unstable, it's actually the radius that keeps flipping back and forth and grinding in, in, into place here. And so, you know, I will agree that all resections will lead to impingement and not all impingements are painful, but when they are painful, it's a significant change in your life. You know, and, and so to that end, we go back to this concept. And so <clears throat> Dr. Kennedy uh, mentioned this article and I have it here again for all the residents and fellows and anybody in the audience that wants to, to have a, a copy of or look at this, this citation. This is an article that is well worth reading. I will tell you, it's, it's very dense. It's a, and so you learn a lot per page, per paragraph in this particular article. But they did divide everything up into bone deformities, unstable ECU, the TFCC, cartilage defects. And with that, they would then break up and address issues that in this case, it's a bone deformity with cartilage defect, no cartilage defect. There's a non-repairable or reparable TFCC tear. You know, is there anything in there? No, it was just the bone deformity. And to that end, this unstable distal radial ulnar joint will be directly impacted by the osteotomies that we saw in previous lectures. And then you can add to that. What if we have bony deformity and a TFCC tear? It means that you have to address both in, in order to get a stable joint. So what happens when you got all of it? You have a bone deformity, you have no cartilage left because it's been resected. Um, the TFCC injury is, is, is floating in place and you have an unstable ECU. Well, <clears throat> here's an example of that and it will lead off for us. Is, this is a patient of mine who in 1995 um, had a resection and um, that is a silastic cap. Uh, Tom Fisher and I are certainly old enough to, to have seen a few silastic caps in, in, in our practices, but those are no longer used. This was replaced in 2000 by uh, a semi-head that then evolved into what you see in 2008 and is accompanied by increasing pain, discomfort, and dysfunction. So what are our choices? We can do nothing, just ignore it and get better. And, and we know the outcome of that uh, from 1856 to 1860. Uh, we could do increasing distal resection. So is it thicker is better? And this was a case series that was presented by people that are really, really smart and, and very good. I've never had much luck with this, although uh, some people have and continue to. When you can't do anything else, we can create a one bone forum. And I have a, a, a series of these that have been recently presented in hand clinics 
but it actually becomes a more and more of a go-to procedure in patients that are just miserable and I can't think of a, a thing to do for them other than creating a one bone form. And is a moderately satisfying experience for these patients because it increases their activities and they do better in life. We could do a repeat inter interposition. And this was popularized by Dean Saturianos in an article that has appeared in 2018. And he looked at a, a number of patients in which he took a piece of allograft, in this case, uh, uh, Achilles tendon, interposed it between the radius and the ulna. And you, you just find it stuck in there in place and he held it in place. And those results were really remarkable. He had improvement in their VAS scores, pronation, supination improved, grip strength improved. There was only one failure and there was one, one fracture. Um, he had three patients who had this scalloping that occurred. And I've got a couple, of, I've done this procedure in, in younger people um, with, uh, with Madlung's deformities and they get this scalloping thing. And I'm, I'm just waiting for that that base of that scallop to break off sometime. And I, well, I don't know what I'm going to do with that, but I think that it may happen. But this was his two year results. So the, this leads us to semi constrained arthroplasty. And semi constrained arthroplasties were introduced to us by Lewis Shepard. And in that article, uh, Mike Carr and Garcia Elias, when they said we've got all of this, all four entities are, are injured and destroyed, there was only one device or one procedure that they thought could address it um, and still have functional pronation and supination. And that was a semi constrained um, hemiarthroplasty shown here. And it's called the Shepherd or the Aptus uh, semi arthroplasty. Now, when they presented it, uh, they presented 46 patients, of which I examined a lot of these patients and, and had the, the opportunity to do that. And they had remarkable improvements. They had one failure, one fracture, and reported two out of 46 um, patients as complications um, with a 5% complication rate. Well. I have this friend, his name is Peter Stern, and he makes a living off of looking at complications and everything can be a complication. And, and if we put this to the Peter Stern test and took the article apart, the complication rate goes up to about 40% because there was a number of, of smaller complications, but there were still complications nonetheless. And it sits at about 40%. And that prompted us at, at the University of Washington going to look at our cases in about 50 plus cases. And uh, this is the work, uh, these, these patients were the, my patients and my uh, partner's patients, Jerry Wong. Uh, the article was put together by Kate Bellevue and Kate Thayer and uh, Mike Julio. And what we found is that our complication wasn't quite as high as that as the complication rate that was presented at the same meeting um, in the Mayo experience. And I'd, I'd like to go through how I address those and what I think I learned from this experience. And I will say right now that I continue to do this operation. So, you know, what's changed for me? Well, the first thing that changed for me is that if you avoid using this standard, this standard stem, the size 30, and use a one centimeter stem, then you won't run into issues with uh, um, heterotopic ossification. So that's our standard. Two is that you got to keep your patients from using this, this extremity to pound things on a repeated basis. And I had two cap loosenings in people that went back to foundation carpentry. But in order to address cap loosening, what has happened is that the, the device has been changed so that loosening is, is much more difficult because of the way that the cap is introduced. And if ever you're using this device, introducing the screw as shown on your far right, and just bringing it down makes it a lot easier to put that on and put it in place. 
in the technique manual, they talk about moving this device quickly. And in our cases where we had adhesions, we had other things going on in the wrists, such as fusions or tendon reconstructions. And in the cases that we had adhesions, they were immobilized for longer than 72 hours. The other thing that we found is that if we did interpose a piece of material between the implant and the tendons, you will get tendonitis and tendon irritation. And this is just shown in, in raising this particular retinacular flap. It is raised and then it is interposed between the extensor carpi ulnaris and the implant itself. And then we had three late infections in this particular case. Um, the thing that we learned from this is in two of those cases, they had had dental extractions or dental manipulations within days of becoming infected. And the case that I show here, this is at, at, at seven years, five to seven years. So I'm sorry, it's at seven years. After a successful implant, he had a root canal. Seven days later, he has an infected joint. And my partner, Jerry Wong, was very nice to be the guy that took this apart, put beads in place um, on a Christmas Eve, and uh, then I reconstructed it six weeks later. I had uh, one permanent explant in a patient who has uh, had a residual infection and should not have been done in the first place. And this is a error in judgment on my part. And that was treated by conversion to a one bone borer. We had three cases of, uh, that uh, of neuritis that we dealt with. Two of them were pre-op. And in those cases, we did neurectomies and buried the uh, dorsocutaneous branch of the ulnar nerve and soft tissues proximally. One of them was a traction injury that I did that was iatrogenic on my part that resolved after three months. We found that if you have arthritis of the elbow, especially the proximal radial ulnar joint, it will be revealed by this procedure as the increased motion and function of the distal radial ulnar joint improves, the irritation of the proximal radial ulnar joint will also uh, be revealed. And this, is a, this prompted a revision of this particular um, elbow in this particular patient. We had four stress, stress fractures, all repeated. All were related to impact loading, two because of demolition, one, in, <clears throat> one was uh, wood splitting, and one was doing old style car, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, car racing. Each of these stress fractures occurred within the first six weeks of the procedure. And as such, I really admonish people not to do that and not to use those as such. So I think that this is still a very good salvage procedure. Um, it shares the forearm convergent load, it prevents bowler and dorsal translation, uh, it follows the forearm axis of rotation. It stabilizes the wrist on an otherwise stable ulna. Um, it does demand attention to detail. And uh, I think that if you pay attention to your complications, uh, you will improve on your, your, your next set of patients. So this is not really a, a, an easy procedure. It is a detailed procedure. So in this particular case, um, how did I treat it? I, I did remove the Ulnar component replaced it with a uh, aptus uh, reconstruction, and uh, she uh, uh, is here uh, at X ray, and she does have a now complication. She has irritation from her wires. So um, I, I, I will, at her, uh, at her choosing, I will be taking out those wires sometime in the next couple months. I, I saw her a couple months ago, but she did, continues to do well. So that's that lecture. So in the last, are there any questions on that particular lecture? Doug, that's outstanding. Thank you. Um, there is a question related a bit to this uh, from Rob, Rob Waisaki. Um, he's asking if uh, what we think as panelists, uh, where the aptus fits into the post-traumatic DRUJ um, mm -hmm. as a, uh, an index procedure for certain patients or 
mainly for the salvage options like the one you showed. So do you want me to answer that question or do you want the pen you want to go through the panel? Uh, let's, let's start with you, Doug, and we'll work okay, our way. I, I, you know, I've got a I, I have been using it as a primary procedure in patients where I think that it's going to be a resection. Um, and they, they, I, I will have a frank discussion with them if it is a guy who says, you know, this is what I do for a living. I shuck oysters and I split wood. Um, I'm not going to do this procedure in that patient. But if I have somebody who is, is, pre, is pretty active, I've got people who are skiers and bikers um, that it was, it was their primary procedure um, in, in the treatment of uh, relatively complex distal radius and distal radial ulnar joint injuries uh, that were referred to me for for follow-up in the setting of post-traumatic arthritis. I, I use it a fair amount with combination of wrist fusions and have done um, a dozen as the primary distal radial ulnar joint procedure in, the, in patients that have post-traumatic radiocarpal arthritis. So what's the rest of the panel think? Oh. I'm happy to chime in, Doug. You know your point's well taken about the six percent. You know I think we all hover around that six percent. What do you do with those when you go down that slippery slope? And it's still a, an unsolved problem, I think, in many ways, because um, uh, you'd like to think these simpler procedures would work, and they tend to. Um, you know, in our SK paper that we just published, we had, you know, out of forty cases, we had maybe three that had convergence that ended up having to get a soterianos procedure as a salvage. And, and I've experienced the same thing with that scalloping. So I haven't gone to the point where I do them as primaries, these, uh, the aptus. Um, actually, yeah, you know, Dick was emboldened by doing them as primaries. Uh, I know he had done them as primaries and had moved on to doing them as primaries because he was so encouraged with the results, but I haven't yet. Um, but certainly I've thought about it a lot and I'm, I'm sure that day is going to come soon. It's encouraging to know that you've had, uh, um, that your threshold for doing them as a primary is, um, is low. Now, it, 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 in contradistinction to that is my partner, Steve Kennedy. Steve, what's your indications for this procedure? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you're right. I, I do prefer to do a, um, uh, an interposition arthroplasty, like a Soterianos um, uh, as my index, I, same, similar to uh, Marco. Um, and uh, I reserved uh, the uh, semi-constrained arthroplasty as my, as my backup. But I certainly can think of, you know, uh, one patient comes to mind where, you know, I, I ultimately did end up doing the semi-constrained and I wonder if he would have had a better, you know, a better result if it had been done sooner. Um, but I certainly avoid it in the um, uh, higher demand uh, individuals where I think that they're going to um, wear it out too quickly. Okay. David? Uh, great talk, Doug, as usual. Um, you know, seeing that some of the experience here when, when I was a fellow with uh, Dick and getting started with this, um, we've certainly seen it and uh, Louis visiting and showing us and talking to us about some tips and tricks and stuff. I still tend to reserve it. Um, I think if it's just the right person and it's a little bit lower demand and they have that problem, I might offer to them directly. Um, but otherwise, I've also seen it work, you know, very well for some of those revisions. And your elbow case reminded me, I had a fellow that came in and had a uh, forearm length problem and had been chased a few times with a shortening and then a radial head resection. And he had, he was just miserable. And fortunately, with the aptus, we were able to balance things a little bit. So I've seen the power of it. Um, I have not had as many in to have too many complications yet, but um, I think your points are great. The problems I have had, we, we did do the flap, as Louis suggested, and you did for the protecting the extensors. Um, and I'm a little bit off topic, but I just didn't want to forget that your point about getting the collar down so you don't wind up with the, things being too tight is, is important. I think the other one is that uh, for those who might be starting doing this, 
trying to use a small implant and making sure the implant stays palmer on the radius and doesn't tilt up is a real help to minimize the uh, intrusion in the extensor tendons too. So I, I would so to answer the question, I try to use a DARA when I can. Uh, my interpositions with allograft tendon all whittle down to the point when the aptus comes in, we're using a very long stem extension or collar. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen that as well, so. Um, I'm sorry, I, I was just distracted by a question. And what was the question again at the very end? The very end was uh, just with when I've done this Tyrannus, I mean, I've had a good result with it for a while, but then you watch the Elena go, and then if they have a problem beyond that, you're looking at a much lo longer collar. Yeah, you, I, you're, you're right. And I have used an, an, a Citurianos conversion, uh, a much longer collar, and, and done it successfully. I mean, so that's, but it was in a relatively low demand. Um, person who, yeah, I, and so I, I couldn't tell you more than that, other than that it's a pretty long collar on that, on that bus driver. In the case that I showed, it was a pretty long collar, uh, but it was stable and, and remained stable. So. so we have a question. We still use to fix DRUJs by putting percutaneous K wires in case of DRUJ fractures with associated instability. Um, your views, do you still do that? Uh, okay, so the question is, is you, you put together a radius, everyone, and you then stabilize, and you have an unstable distal radial ulnar joint, or, or you, you think it is. How many of us still use K wires crossing from the ulna into the radius to stabilize that DRUJ. You know, I can say that I haven't done that in 15 years. And I think the reason that I haven't is I think I've figured out how to stabilize and reconstruct the sigmoid notch. And I spend a whole lot of time doing that with the with the impact that I look at a distal radius fracture as a reconstruction of the lunate fossa, the sigmoid notch, and then the radiostyloid stuff is, is just a bonus. I, th I think I view the radiostyloid as, as, a, as a piece of material that's there to stabilize the radio capitate, the radiocarpal ligaments. So the panel, how many people still use cross K wire? I mean, why is that cross from the ulna to the radius? Well, I use it very rarely. Um, my preference, you know, if, if you, I think it's kind of that stepwise algorithm that you're talking about, the next stage, uh, similar to what was mentioned in, uh, you know, uh, Dave's talk earlier on, is that um, when you get to the stage where you're still having a stability, I, I prefer to repair the ulnar styloid fracture fragment and, uh, or the ulna uh, insertion. And if it's still unstable after that, then I might consider the uh, cross pinning. And I um I think it's counter. You know, I've only you know I, I rarely do it. If I do do it, I do do it in a little bit of supination. I think most people do it in neutral. Um, I don't know what other people think about that. So Tom, do you if you are doing a, a DRUJ reconstruction and you're splitting them. Are you splitting them in neutral? Are you splitting them in pronation? Are you splitting them in supination? And I'll ask you, I'll, we'll just go down the list. Tom, we touched I, on this a little bit. Which, wh where, where are you immobilizing them? I, I put them in about uh, 10 to 20 degrees of uh, supination. I don't think it makes a lot of difference between neutral, but what you don't want to put them in is pronation. So if you go offset supination, they usually stick pretty well. I don't pin it anymore uh, just because the number of pins that I've seen broken and they used to break when I put them in. And the problem is the bigger your pins, the bigger the defect in the ulna and you leave a stress riser, especially with obliquely uh, drilled pins. Uh, pins get dull after about the first cortex. And so you're just incinerating three cortices after you've gone through the first in young healthy patients. Uh, my preference, I think, and I think uh, Dave Dennison showed a an X fix that was crossing from radius to ulna. Uh, I use a box frame external fixer when I have gross instability after everything's corrected and I've tacked back down my 
my fovea and I've repaired my soft tissues, but I just still feel like it's just loosey goosey because of usually high energy vehicular trauma. And uh, I'll put two big pins in the ulna, two big pins in the radius uh, away from the uh, away from the reconstruction site so I don't have pins sticking out where I've just fixed things and hold the two bones together and I can kind of get my dorsal ulnar translation better and I don't compress the two bones together and so I, I really feel pretty good about a box frame X fix uh, on the outside that uh, holds the form. You can still bend the wrist that way and you still move the elbow but you just can't rotate the form. It... Yeah, um, I did have this. I'd be happy to share those pictures again. But I think, yeah, I, I, Doug, I think what you said is exactly how I try to do it. Is like I try to convert it back to something that's pretty stable and neutral. To a little, I, I agree, a little supination, and we don't want pronation. And I try really hard to get everything to to work like that. And I think in the acute setting, I it's it's much more um, likely you can achieve that. When that person comes in and they've been out for six weeks or six months and you're trying to get them back and they're springy and they, you know, if that's the right word, but yeah. that's not a good feeling. And I, I would say that's, I've tried some other things, the X fix or the pins, but I worry that, you know, if I can't get it down, but some of those people have a, a disorder that goes farther up the forum and we're, you know, we're trying our best. Um, but I, I try to use it sparingly. I, I use it infrequently because of that picture I showed, which, um, you know, broken pins, maybe infection, loosening, bone, it just not great. I mean, if you have to, yes. And and mine broke, you know, we all put them in a Munster or something or a long arm and they still can break or wiggle. So if you think that you can get by without that, I would say great, but good luck. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's now 540 or on, on the coast, it's 840 on your time. Um, are there any questions that we have one more question that popped up? I don't mind K wire transfixion to offload a chronic DRUJ stabilization using an ACL guide has made this smoother, eliminates uh, eccentric pin placement, and has helped to avoid loosening. Any other thoughts or tips about this or alternatives uh, for mobilization? And uh, that's uh, from an anonymous attendee in, in, the, in the conference. And so I think that's good advice. If you're gonna use it, I, I love to use ACL guides. Mostly I like the ones that are broken that are just off just enough so that when you drive a pin through, it doesn't hit the tip of the ACL guide, it bypasses it. And if you do that, you can create a hole that you can pass wires through, that you can pass sutures through, especially when I'm doing things like coronoid fractures. Yeah, no, I, terrible triads, but that's uh, that's great advice. So, um, is there anybody else that has any other questions, any comments from the faculty? And thanks for there, thanks for everyone for sharing. I learned a lot, and um, thanks, Doug, for giving us the guidance and the outline. This was outstanding. I really appreciate everyone's uh, participation, and thanks for all the questions from everyone. And um, I hope you all have a great night. Well, thank you for the opportunity to surround myself with, uh, with people a lot smarter than me. And it's always a pleasure to learn from you. So thank you and, and good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you all very much. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Doug. Thanks, Marco. Thanks, Doug. Hey, Marco, Thanks, Doug, Tom. Steve. Thanks, Tom. Steve. Bye. Thanks. Have a good night, everyone. Mm -hmm.